better stand. Understanding Medicine I am Professor Azizur Rahman and we are going to talk about lung cancer today. First of all, let me explain why lung cancer is included in my lecture in internal medicine. Because lung cancer actually does not present as a lump and usually people with lump they go to surgeon straight. But lung cancer usually present with respiratory symptoms or some other medical symptoms. They are mostly initially uh, diagnosed by physicians so I think it is very relevant to internal medicine. Since it's a long topic I have divided it into two. In the first lecture I will discuss the basics and in the next one I will discuss some advanced uh, features of this disease. Uh, introduction and clinical feature uh, in this particular lecture. Its a definition, it's a malignant tumor arising from lung epithelium. Uh, it's a vague term, uh, but it could be mucosa of main airways, small airways, but it is not the other uh, structures of uh, lung like cartilage, the connective tissue, the liver tissue. So those tumors, they have separate name. If there is a malignancy, which arises from the mucosa of the airways that is called lung cancer or previously used to be called bronchogenic carcinoma or bronchial carcinoma. So I think either of the terms you could use. So let me explain the pathogenesis. Mostly the pathogenesis of malignancies is not very well known. We know certain factors which predispose, particularly in lung cancer, and we also know uh, the rough mechanism, but some of the uh, links are missing. But we know, we, I present here, uh, for all malignancies, there is a genetic factor. The people who are more prone to develop any cancer, including lung cancer, are secondary to exposure to certain carcinogens. And then the most important carcinogen, I think the most uh, proven beyond any doubt is chronic smoking and some other irritants like many other pollutants are also considered to be contributory. Active smoking and to certain extent passive smoking also. This smoking includes cigarette, hookah, pipe, cigar or even this vaping. So all types of smoking is responsible or can be responsible for lung cancer. And also it is the total amount of smoking. Like for example, somebody has been smoker for very long. He would have more risk than a, a, a compared to another person who has been smoker for much shorter duration. And also depends on the number of cigarette smokes average per day. So we actually calculate the years of smoking and packs per year. So that's a concept of total amount of um, smoking is actually relevant. Of course, every smoker does not develop lung cancer and every body with lung cancer is not necessarily a smoker. But smoking, of course, remains the most important proven and preventable cause of lung cancer. So because of chronic irritation, you know, smoke is an irritant because there are at least 300 chemicals in it. So those chemicals and the smoke particles, they cause irritation and as a result of irritation, there is metaplasia and metaplasia leads to dysplasia, which is like a pre-malignant condition that leads to carcinoma in situ. There is malignancy, but just restricted to one part it hasn't gone anywhere. It is carcinoma in situ. And then, of course, a full-fledged cancer is developed. And then it could actually go to the regional lymph nodes, the neighboring lung, uh, the lung parenchyma, and, of course, it goes to any part of the body, wherever it wants to, brain and bones and the liver and the adrenals and everywhere. So that is when it becomes very, very serious. Prevalence is one of the commonest cancers in men 
I think the commonest cancer is prostate cancer and bronchial bronchogenic carcinoma or lung cancer the second commonest and in women after breast cancer bronchogenic cancer uh, lung cancer the second commonest so it's fairly common in our country I think uh, liver cancer is perhaps commoner than bronchogenic carcinoma because of very prevalent chronic hepatitis B and C now we can classify uh, lung cancer from histological point of view and also from the treatment and prognosis point of view so if you are able to take a biopsy a biopsy could be from the sputum and from the uh, bronchoscope or could be some transcutaneous tissue so if you have biopsy then you will be able to classify lung cancer accordingly according to the histological changes squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinomas both are relatively common approximately 40 percent squamous cell carcinoma arises from the squamous cell from the endothelium of the main airways whereas adenocarcinoma arises from the glands of the uh, bronchial tree and a squamous cell carcinoma happens to be more central whereas adenocarcinoma is more likely to be slightly peripheral of course you cannot differentiate between the two without biopsy small cell carcinoma is very uh, unique in the sense it is not present in more than about 5 to 10 percent of the cases but it is unique because it has got some uh, paraneoplastic features and it tend to metastasize very early large large cell carcinoma also is a very very poorly differentiated lung cancer and it also tends to metastasize early and both these lung cancers like small cell large cells are relatively resistant to treatment also then miscellaneous so mostly uh, we will be dealing with squamous cell and adenocarcinoma but in some cases there may be small cell or large cell also so this is the classification from histological point of view there is another classification and that is from the prognosis and treatment now disregard to the cell type we want to know if it is small cell or non small cell like we just want to know if it is small cell because small cell lung cancer abbreviated as smlc that tends to metastasize very early so approximately all with the time of diagnosis they have stage 4 disease or at least uh, it is a generalized disease actually this staging concept 1 2 3 4 does not uh, apply to small cell as i will discuss shortly so small we want to know if it is small cell lung cancer or if it is non small cell of course non small cell will include squamous cell adenocarcinoma and large cell so i think this is another classification because small cell has got very poor prognosis as compared to all others right so etiology uh, smoking is important genetic factors are important scarring and it has been seen and uh, that those who have previous infections lung abscess or tuberculosis sometimes malignancy developed from that scar asbestos is one of the industrial uh, substance and those who are exposed to asbestos they are definitely prone to develop mesothelial uh, lung cancer but also bronchial uh, cancer and other types of pollution are also important like exposure to radiation and all that is important now this graph shows these are two curves you can see uh, this curve the cigarette smoking uh, as the prevalence of cigarette smoking almost a duplicate of this after about 20 years there is another graph which is showing the prevalence of lung cancer so this actually at least theoretically uh, shows that the prevalence of lung cancer rose as the the habits of smoking increase so that is one epidemiological way of linking smoking with lung cancer these days uh, the in 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 developed world at least the prevalence of lung cancer is on the decline perhaps because of some uh, 
uh, reduction in smoking habits, at least in men. In women, perhaps it is still on the rise, and in the rest of the world, also it is still on the rise. The presentation of lung cancer, first of all, it may be just an incidental finding. Uh, you did an x-ray for some other reason, but you found an opacity. This opacity could be a coin lesion or it could be some other kind of opacity, but a distally located coin lesions are mostly asymptomatic. And of course, there are other possibilities of the coin lesions. There's a long differential diagnosis, but one of the possibilities is lung cancers. So sometimes patient may not have any symptoms whatsoever, but on routine XHS, you may find uh, uh, the clue to the diagnosis in the form of an opacity. But the symptoms are hemoptysis, weight loss, clubbing in the background of COPD in a smoker. I think that would be the typical presentation. Now, let me uh, make a disclaimer. The commonest cause of hemoptysis, even in smokers, is not lung cancer. The commonest cause of hemoptysis is simple chronic bronchitis or acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, simple infection in people who smoke. But one of the possibilities is lung cancer. You certainly do not want to miss lung cancer. If the hemoptysis is associated with unexplained weight loss, and if you see clubbing, clubbing of course is possible in other lung diseases also, but if one of them is lung cancer, and if somebody is smoker and has COPD, there should be very, very strong suspicion of malignancy, particularly if this patient has an opacity on XHS. Uh, sometime uh, uh, the supraclavical lymph adenopathy uh, may be uh, the primary presentation and just a routine examination you may find supraclavical lymph node and later on on X-ray you find that there was actually an opacity in the lung. Then uh, this is a very important statement. My teacher Professor Mahmoud Ali Malik used to say this that lung cancer is master of disguise. It can, presume any, it can produce any symptom, any sign, and any laboratory abnormality. Because of its local uh, invasion, because of its uh, distant uh, metastasis, and also because of its distant non-metastatic manifestation through paraneoplastic syndrome. So I, actually, theoretically, any symptom could fit in the symptomatology of lung cancer. So that is why these patients, they come to physicians first. So uh, the clinical features, uh, first of all, asymptomatic. Number two, local complication. Because once it, the tumor grows, a very small tumor will not cause any symptom, but once it grows, it will cause bronchial narrowing, bronchial obstruction, and then it will infiltrate into the lung parenchyma and any neighboring structure like pericardium, like blood vessels, like other lungs. So I think esophagus, the local complication, then distant metastatic manifestation because this metastasize to brain and the bone and symptoms could be from there. And then very interesting, uh, that distant non-metastatic complication. I will, in a very, very um, uh, brief manner, I will uh, give you the detail of all these. We will take up all these, uh, first of all, local complication. Now, I have, I think, very, to make it simple, I have listed these things. These are the structures in the lung. Bronchi, pleura, pericardium, lymphatics, phrenic nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve, sympathetic nerves, ribs, spine, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, and superior sulcus. So, if you just imagine involvement of any of the structure, you can then build up the possible symptom. For example, if it is involvement of the bronchi, it could lead to collapse. A bronchial obstruction would lead to collapse or it may cause secondary consolidation and hemoptysis. And if it involves pleura, it would cause pleural fusion, usually large. And of course, if there is a pleural fusion, there would be dyspnea, there may be certain signs, there may be shift of trachea, all these signs would be present. Then pericardium, there could be pericardial effusion, patient may present with cardiomegaly or 
cardiac uh, pericardial tamponade, dyspnea, or other things. If it is lymphatic involvement, it may give rise to a typical X-ray appearance called lymphangitis carcinomatosis. This is infiltration of lymphatics with lung cancer cell. If it involves phrenic nerve, it may cause diaphragm paralysis and may cause respiratory difficulties. You may diagnose diaphragm paralysis on clinical examination on fluoroscopy uh, also and on XHS also. So if this is involvement of recurrent laryngeal nerve, and this is the nerve which um, uh, supplies our epiglottis. So if that is the case, then there may be hoarseness. Anybody who has prolonged hoarseness, I think that person must be investigated. It's a rule, short term hoarseness for just one week or maybe few days, maybe due to viral infection or some allergic process. But if it is prolonged hoarseness, of course, hypothyroidism is also a possibility, but I think uh, you need to rule out a cancer, either epiglottic cancer, uh, vocal cord malignancy or, or, or lung cancer. It may affect sympathetic nerves, it may cause Horner syndrome, a tumor which is situated on the uh, apex of the uh, lung that may involve the sympathetic nerves. You know, sympathetic nerves, first thoracic nerve that uh, that supplies our uh, pupil, so that may cause Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome is a complex of very mild ptosis and constricted pupil and some and absence of um, uh, sweating on that area. So, and if this malignancy infiltrate into the ribs, it may cause localized chest pain uh, or it may cause rib fractures. If it affects spines, depending upon which part the thoracic spine, if there, there is a compression of spinal cord, it may lead to paraplegia. There would be upper motor neuron type of paralysis in the lower limbs. Now it can impinge upon the inferior vena cava and may cause inferior vena cava obstruction syndrome. It may also press the superior vena cava and cause superior vena cava obstruction. And then superior circus may cause Pancos syndrome. Pancos syndrome is a complex of symptomatology when the tumor is in the, the upper part of the lung. It could affect your the, some structure going to the arm, subclavian uh, vessels and nerves and also the, some other features. So I think very easy way is just to imagine any structure in the lung, in the chest and malignancy, bronchogenic carcinoma does not respect the anatomy. It just eats up whatever comes on its way. So it will affect any or all of these organs. So there could be any symptom from the respiratory tract. So this was a complication uh, due to local invasion. Now this is the distant and due to metastasis. If there is involvement of the brain, there may be headache, there may be paralysis or there may be seizures, right? And of course, there could be other symptoms, but these are the common symptoms depending upon which part of the brain there is metastasis, there would be these symptoms. It could go to the liver and it could cause liver enlargement and liver will be typically uh, irregular and there will be hard and on ultrasound you will find a mass. If it goes to the bone, it may cause bone pain, localized bone pains and fractures. And one favorite site of uh, lung cancer to go to is adrenals, adrenals and sometimes there may be bilateral adrenal involvement. Uh, we do not know exactly why uh, these malignancies, uh, the bronchogenic malignancies go to adrenals, but theoretically they could destroy both adrenal glands and one can develop adrenal insufficiency. Then any other part, wherever, I mean, any, any structure can be affected. These are complications due to metastasis. And you know, these lung cancers, they are very prone to metastasize, especially the small lung cancer, small cell cancer. Then uh, all malignancies, they have this potential of de-differentiation and then re-differentiation into 
some hormone producing cells these are some cells which have got these features now there could be production of parathormone like or related peptide pth is parathormone so some cancers as they produce lung cancer they produce parathormone related peptide that means it has got the function of parathormone but it is not actually parathormone when you measure it it will not be measured as pdh so but it has got the function of pdh and if that is a the case then patient may develop a clinical syndrome of hyperparathyroidism patient may have hypercalcemia patient may have uh, hypophosphatemia and patient may have increased alkaline phosphate is all the features of hyperparathyroidism when you measure their pth it would be either normal or suppressed but pth related peptide is also uh, can be measured and that would be elevated this is done on the with the technique of monoclonal antibodies anti diuretic hormone may also be elevated and if that is the case patient will develop syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion and that is when we have too much adh and what body has too much water there may be hyponatremia there may be hypoosmolality and things like that so patient also has relatively concentrated urine and uh, when a patient will uh, only on testing one would know that the urine is uh, rich in sodium so that is how patient develops hyponatremia and then acth some malignancies small cell lung cancers they may produce acth um, uh, this corticotropin or acth like substance it would stimulate both the adrenals and patient will develop cushing syndrome cushing syndrome means patient would have all the features of excess cortisone i mean i have a separate lecture if somebody is interested to know what is cushing syndrome and they can refer to that lecture then there are many other things we do not know what hormone or what substance is responsible patient with lung cancer they develop clubbing we don't know the mechanism myopathy neuropathy eaton lambert syndrome which is a syndrome like periodic muscle weakness and then ichthyosis nigri cans all these features all these problems can develop in people with lung cancer we do not know but we do suspect it, it is some peptide some hormone some substance which is produced by the malignant tissue so i think by now you would be convinced that my statement that lung cancer is a master of disguise it can produce any symptom any sign or any laboratory abnormality so you need to keep a very high suspicion particularly in people with smoking and copd so these are some of the pictures and you can see this uh, this is the tumor arising from the bronchus this is actually not the actual uh, specimen this is the second Uh, this is the artwork this is a tumor and this is a tumor and this is also tumor which is gone to the lung part upper part then this is a cut section this is actual specimen this is you can see the cut section bronchus and this is a tumor and this is also multiple deposits malignancies it could go to any way this is a metastasis in the liver this is a metastasis in the brain and the spines and this is the primary tumor it could go actually anywhere so these are just some of the uh, pictures to to give you the better concept of this malignancy now this patient has got swollen face and neck veins are engorged and when i examined this patient had all the features of spirovenicular obstruction and ultimately when we investigated him he was found to have malignancy of lung cancer lung cancer this is another person he also had uh, he had all the features of inferior vein reconstruction you can see these veins are engorged but upper portion there are no engorged veins and this guy had again inferior vein reconstruction and although this was relatively young person but he also had lung cancer so that is all this was very basic i mean we just covered uh, the 
prevalence of lung cancer, the pathogenesis of lung cancer, symptoms and I highlighted that any symptom, any sign, any laboratory abnormalities can be associated with lung cancer because of its local invasion, because of its distant metastasis and because of its uh, paraneoplastic uh, syndromes, many hormones which this cancer, this cancer may produce. So this has been Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan. I'd like to see you again in my next video, which is going to cover the remaining part of the lung cancer, the diagnosis and the treatment. Thank you very much.